Cal County. But Mr. Emmerich's very concerned and his buddy with the uh, Agricultural Chemical Commission. They're all real conservative guys, but they formed the Bigger Pie Forum. And the purpose of the Bigger Pie Forum is to oppose the continued construction of this power plant, saying Mississippi Power Company uh, is going to bankrupt this state. They're going to stop development in Mississippi because it's going to suck all the, all the income out of the state to put into this power plant that may not even work. And Mississippi Power has now created a labor union front group to oppose the Bigger Pie people to promote to support the plant because they decided that maybe they would go ahead and make a union because they needed to get additional <laughs> political support. So the non-union plant that they couldn't get enough people to work at became a union construction site so they would get additional political support. And they created a pro-power plant union group. And then they created a pro-power plant business group that the Mississippi Power cooked up. Well, Mr. Bentz, our public service commissioner, who's largely responsible for decision to do this thing, has now got his daddy got him another job working for the development thing. His daddy's the secretary of it, and he's going to be the director of it, and his salary is going to be doubled from what he was getting at the Public Service Commission. So he's resigned from the Public Service Commission. He's out of it. This is not the indication of a popular project. It's, it's destined for success if your main political guy is walking away from it and pretending like he doesn't see it anymore. And, uh, the southern companies get hammered in the stock market, and the Public Service Commission says, we're not going to give you any more money. And the Mississippi Power Company, the southern company, has now agreed to eat half the cost of the current overrun. Now, there's still additional overrun to come, and it's not clear who's going to pay for that. But of the current overrun, Mississippi Power Company is not going to get it out of the rate payers. They're going to have to get it from the shareholders. Southern company stock is not looking too good because of that. And now people in Georgia, including Georgia Public Service Commission members, which is pretty amazing, are saying, well, if y'all can make an agreement like that in Mississippi, why can't you do that on these cost overruns over here at this nuclear plant? Oh, why, why, why can't we get, a, get an arrangement like that? And by the way, why can't we have solar power in Georgia anyway? And the people that are pushing for solar power in Georgia are the Atlanta Tea Party. And so what is happening is there used to be a real clear us and them. But now them is divided up into pieces of us and them. And some of the us and them there are lining up with the them, but the rest of them, the us, you know, it's the division, the fight over the division of resources is changing daily. And you can see that right in your state capital. You can probably see it in your county commission where people are starting to look at the underlying realities and to realize that everything is not as simple as it has been presented to be. And we might get out of this okay, and we might not. But if we just stand around and watch and let other people continue to make the decisions based on the record of those other people's decisions up to now, it's not looking too good for the general run of people. And the most interesting political aspect of this, in, in, for me, in my work at the legislature, was 15 years ago, maybe more than that, time really flies when you're having a good time. <laughs> the older I get, God, it's just so quick. But uh, maybe it's 20 years ago. Anyway, there was this problem that some call the sage bush brush Y'all remember that term, the sage or brush rebellion? That was these guys out in the western states that, you know, where they got all this federal land, and they graze on the federal land, and they log on the federal land, and they drill oil and all, and they were having to pay these fees that they regarded as too high, and they wanted to cut the fees they were paying off. So they had this sage brush rebellion, and they started saying, oh, all these regulations, meaning all these bills we have to pay, are unreasonable and unfair, and they're interfering with business and blah, blah, blah. We want to get rid of all these regulations. So there was all this anti-regulation talk. And they, kept, they started saying, well, it, it's uh, interfering with our property rights. And uh, so I'm thinking this property rights noise. And we started worrying about, God, what if that comes to us? We're going in there. What are we going to do? And so I was working with this uh, tree farmer from up there in Gordon's uh, Pine Mountain area at that time. And he said, well, let's go talk to the, to the, uh, 
to the forestry boys in the, in the Farm Bureau about this. And so we did. We, we had a meeting with them at the Capitol. And uh, we talked to them about this regular, it was called regulatory takings. The idea that a regulation could take the value of your property away and so that whoever made that regulation would have to pay you whatever your putative loss was for the value of your property based on the implementation of the regulation. We started talking this uh, to the Farm Bureau and the Forestry Association, of uh, the lobbyist and the director, and they said, uh, yeah, we've heard about that, but uh, we're not too much interested in, in that. We don't think that's a real issue here. Uh, and the reason was they'd already controlled all regulations. I mean, you got your, you know, the State Forestry Commission is basically the forest industry's branch of state government. They, they own it and operate it. And the agriculture department, I don't even need to go there. And um, same thing. But that, that regulation was not a threat to their economic interests. But there was an aspect of government that they did regard as a threat to their interests that was still somewhat regulatory. It certainly affected property base. And that was eminent domain. And they hated the DOT, the Georgia Department of Transportation, was ruining property all over this state. And they were doing it two ways. One was willy-nilly condemnation. They needed to corner your field. They wouldn't take the corner, they'd take the whole damn field. And the other thing was they would change the land where they took the property. They would frequently ruin what they left to you by altering the drainage patterns or some other change, altering access to it. It would be changes. And I know I-16, I y'all don't get to use I-16, enjoy I-16 the way a lot of us do. I, I rode down I-16 with an old lawyer friend of mine and practiced over there in the pathway of I-16 for a number of years. And every bridge over that road, every time we passed it, he could tell me the story of how many farms were ruined between that bridge and the next bridge. I-16 was nothing but a political bully boy operation <laughs> of just people that had not voted right or had contributed wrong or had done something wrong and it made Mr. Gillis mad. They paid when I-16 went through. And somebody in Statesboro was, I don't know what those people in Statesboro did, and I've never been able to get to the bottom of it, but Statesboro, Georgia is 15 miles from I-16 for a reason. <laughs> if it's not for the convenience of the people of Statesboro, I can assure you of that. Matter one, the uh, I-16 route thing between Matter and Statesboro, it matters nothing. So uh, in any case, if those decisions, the, the forestry guys, the Farm Bureau, and the forestry guys even had people on their board at that time who did not want the DOT to build the outer perimeter highway around Atlanta because they'd already ruined forestry in the metro area. This is 20 years ago. You remember Gordon's maps about housing? All those blobs of houses, that's places you can't practice forestry anymore. And that was growing, and they knew that if they built that road, it would grow that much faster. So they opposed that road. They also opposed spending the amount of public money. I mean, you know, it is public money that fills these roads. It's not just uh, the, the uh, road, the money in Atlanta. It's the whole state. So we, we worked together. We said, okay, we'll, we'll help you on this. We agree with you. This is, we worked together on this. And it was on that, that was the start, the germ of this uh, looking at property rights of individual property owners as a basis for political action across lines that had always seemed pretty much politically insurmountable. And uh, that has continued all my life, for 20 years, that's what I've done, is work on property rights issues. And increasingly, what I've seen because of this earlier fight I was talking about among the people who make the economic decisions, there are a lot of big business people who would love to get rid of common law property rights. If they could get rid of this ancient system of land tenure where you have a fee simple title to property, if they could get rid of that, it would clear the way to, for many, many projects that are now stopped by stubborn landowners who want to live and enjoy their property the way they want to. You know? And, and the, the common law property rights are a real barrier to what they call development. 
And we've seen it in Georgia. We've had bills. They had one bill where they were going to fix it where the developer could go to the county commission and literally say, I want you to go condemn the Widow Brown's farm for me so I can put a shopping center out there. I mean, there was a law proposed to do that. We killed it, and, and we were able to kill it, making an argument that is pretty obvious. I mean, that's not right. In fact, I said that to a judiciary subcommittee I mean, the first time I heard it. I said, I just don't see how it's right for a man to go and buy a county commission to then condemn somebody else's property. That, where does that stop? And that's a good question. Where does it stop? And right now, the private property rights, including that uh, riparian right that Gordon talked about, is a matter of contest in your legislature right now. And I, I've tried to point out to you in this last memory that this is a contest that is going on in the neighborhood. And it's going on right in your neighborhood. It's part of the same political struggle everywhere in the world. And it's not a coincidence. This is not some accident or a strange little aberration. This is an unavoidable aspect of the world economy that we've got now, and it's come to our doorsteps, in many cases, literally our doorsteps. And so uh, what we have to do is make a politics or do a political project that realizes the advantages we have at this moment in our political history. We can put together a coalition of people who 15, 10, even five years ago had no use for each other there at all. And now all of a sudden, they're about, they're about our best friends. And I'm seeing that more and more and more every day. And it's ironic that the reddest states, the South, you know, where the Solomon's Republicans, that's where it's most advanced. That's where the Tea Party's fighting for solar power. That's where the bigger pie is fighting to stop the wasteful power plant. It's in the South has turned out to be the leader in the country in this struggle. And it's over exactly these issues, which are basically traditional value issues, property rights. I mean, what we're learning, and it never occurred to me until very recently, Property rights are human rights <laughs> in, in our country. And that's a fundamental human right that there are people who want to get rid of it because it interferes with their ability to realize what they honestly believe to be their rightful return on their investment. And uh, that, that's the, the struggle. And I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't think there's any need to go into any more detail since Gordon has already showed you the details that the uh, Literally the grassroots level. So uh, I don't know whether I'm not watching the time. The clock's wrong. The clock's stopped. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my, my opinion is you, you set it up, and after the break, because I think we're scheduled for a little 10 minute break, we'll talk about two specific examples Senate Bill 213 and this Hodge Capo thing. That's uh, fine. That, that are direct attacks on property rights. That are things you need to be involved in now. Right? So, uh, so we go. Yeah. Yeah. Break time.